Welcome back to the STARS SME Thought Leadership Series 2019 presented by CIMB Bank Burhat. Let's proceed to our third plenary. This speaker is an experienced international Islamic banking and finance professional whose interests include product development, commercial banking, international trade, poverty alleviation, fintech and environmental sustainability. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Hussam Sultan, the original head commercial and transaction banking of CIMB Islamic Bank Burhat, as he will be sharing his presentation on Islamic economic blueprint. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here this morning. Um, I must admit, though, that I'm petrified when she said I'll be talking about the blueprint for Islamic economy. <laughs> blueprint, uh, master plans, and roadmaps are government terms. And uh, if you remember back in the 2020 budget of the Malaysian government um, a few weeks ago, there was a mention of the formulation by the Malaysian government of a blueprint um, of Islamic economy. So I'm not going to be talking about the government's blueprint or the formula for how they will put together a blueprint for Islamic economy. What I want to talk today about is, is um, I really prefer to just have a chat and, and talk rather than present because there's a few slides there, plenty of colors, uh, numbers, um, world map with all sorts of things. But I have very key messages that after the end of this, I, I just want you to take away the fact and uh, how relevant the Islamic economy is, how relevant is the halal certification to your business is. You will be surprised, um, as I was surprised many years ago when I realized that this bottle of water also is halal certified. And I asked myself, and what's so halal or non-halal or Islamic or non-Islamic about water and about plastic? That's when I realized there's none. There's no relevance whatsoever to the religion or it's about commercial and how much uh, access this certification will give to certain products, to certain markets. And, and this is really the main point that I'm trying to, to drill here today with you. Um, I, I remember this very clearly because years ago I was also a, you know, as a student in the UK, I used to go to big supermarkets and um, you realize that, you know, you will not be able to purchase any halal products in supermarkets. You'll have to go to certain shops, you know, where they mostly will be run by uh, Indian, Pakistanis, Arabs. Uh, a decade later, that changed. You go to a supermarket and you will find some sections there where they sell exotic foods. You know, you'll find Asian, you'll find the Chinese, the Indian, spicy food, and then you'll find halal section, small. And then that grew with time. Now, in my area, when I go and visit the UK, I visit my local supermarket, Asda, and I find that they have a large butchery, all halal products. And the halal products are no longer a small section, but are blended. You can find them in many other shelves. What has happened, not many people, Muslims are still minority in that area, not many people converted. However, the commercial aspects of these products and the consumer demand for these products um, became more clearly advantageous to businesses. When businesses realize that by just having a small certification, they will have access to a larger, to a wider audience, to a, li a larger uh, buyers, pool of buyers, then they Consider this as a maybe it's a good idea. More so for Malaysia, this is a lot more relevant. Um, Malaysia has been for a while, and this has given Malaysia a, a huge advantage globally um, in the uh, leadership of the Islamic finance, of the halal industry, of the f formulating this kind of business lines. What has happened now? We spoke earlier about um, blueprint. Now, earlier this year, the government of uh, Indonesia also published their Islamic economy master plan. And a few years before that, Dubai in the United Arab Emirates self-declared themselves as the global capital for Islamic economy. So something is going on there. There is some com competition there to capture some growing market share globally. Yes, there is. Um, I will be sharing with you some statistics and some numbers. Um, see, I, I changed the title of my presentation. There's no longer blueprint. <laughs> I, I will share some numbers. I'll share some um, graphs and statistics. These were uh, 
published last week by the uh, Global Islamic Economy Report 2018, uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, published by, um, uh, the research was done by a company based in New York called Dinar Standard, supported by the government of Dubai and Salam Gateway. We were one of the sponsors there. What is the main idea that, that they're trying to drill there is, number one, the size of the economy, the Islamic economy size. As you can see, it's growing um, at a higher rate than, than most economies. The six identified real economy sectors there, uh, halal food, modest fashion, media recreation, Muslim-friendly travel, halal pharmaceuticals, and halal cosmetics are all showing signs of growth. Over the next few years, the size of this global economy will reach 6.6 .6 trillion US dollars. Uh, this is a very conservative estimate based on the number of you know, the Muslim populations globally and how much they are expected to spend in each country. So in some countries, they will spend more. In other countries, they'll spend less. Analyze this data, put it together, and expect this to be um, this is how they reach numbers. It doesn't take into account the fact that, you know, everyone today was drinking halal certified water. It's no longer about Muslims or Muslim community. It's about, it's like vegetarian food. It's no longer about, you know, you have to subscribe to a certain belief to enjoy a vegetarian dish anymore. And I think this is um, a very enlightening when, when they publish these numbers. And you can see that, you know, that there is a growing demand for this. Um, uh, Growing economies uh, uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, and um, some of the numbers that I'll show as for each of these sectors, uh, you'll be surprised which countries actually take the lead in terms of production and export. At the moment, proudly to say that Malaysia is still the number one ranking in terms of the, the global Islamic economy. This is something that has taken a lot of hard work by the government, by the regulators, and by the SMEs as well. Hence, we have that this is the main point that I would like to, to emphasize here, is that how do we maintain this advantage, advantage for Malaysia? How do we continue to keep Malaysia the leading uh, player in this field globally? Um, again, it's, uh, my belief is that yes, you know, if you think about the world's biggest, hala uh, world's biggest food brand or manufacturer, wh wh what would you think? Nestle, right? The number one brand in food and beverages. Now, if I ask you which is the world's biggest halal food and beverages brand, which one is it? Guess what? Also Nestle. Why are they doing it? Because there is a market demand there, and it's a growing market demand. So these are the numbers here now, at the end of 2018, uh, and the um, expected numbers to be by um, 2024, in five years' time. Halal food is 1.36 trillion, growing to 1.972 trillion. I mean, these numbers probably in the next year's report, these numbers are likely to go higher because their methodology of um, arriving at these numbers would have been refined even further. I saw some other statistics that mentioned that the numbers for halal food specifically could be up to 20 trillion because if you take the market size and the purchasing power of other unaccounted for consumers. Modest fashion also, this is a growing market here, and it doesn't necessarily speak about uh, uh, tudongs or, or, or a certain way of dressing, but textile industries, the demand in certain markets for certain textiles and, and fashion, and it's growing. I, had, um, I was speaking a few days ago with one of Malaysia's um, leading fashion designers, and he was saying that they have a lot of demands now for um, um, exhibitions to, to go and show the, the, these kind of uh, modest fashions in countries like Italy, in Milan, in, in the US. Again, not necessarily a Muslim dominated countries or demand is generated by Muslims, but an interested consumer who may be looking after that. I'll speak in a minute shortly about the drivers of this global economy. Media and recreation, you know, filmmaking, media, uh, songs, the Maher Zain concerts and all that, books, uh, TV programs, documentaries, etc., etc. Muslim friendly travel, Hajj, Umrah, uh, tourism. It was mentioned earlier this morning about, you know, Malaysia as a tourism hub. This is one of the areas that we know Malaysia should continue to be a tourism hub for people from the Middle East and people from the other parts of the world who will find Malaysia to be. Muslim friendly, will be a, an attractive country, beautiful scenery, has everything else to offer for consumers and, and tourists. Halal pharmaceuticals and halal cosmetics are also growing sectors uh, globally. And then we have Islamic finance. 
obviously the Islamic finance, is, this has been a, a, a growing debate as to, to the size of the Islamic banking industry, but at the moment it's 2.5 trillion US dollars, uh, expected to reach 3.4 trillion US dollars by 2024 at a growth, 3.5% year on year growth. Um, as you can see, this industry has started to mature now. I mean, 15 years ago, the growth rate would have been 20% year on year. It has now dropped down as the market is maturing towards the Islamic banking industry. Now, what are the drivers, core drivers for this Islamic economy globally? Number one is the growing population. At the moment, uh, we have about 1.8 billion Muslims uh, worldwide. Um, interesting because I was, uh, I was reading uh, when I was doing some research, um, foreign policy magazine, there were the big article there, they're saying China wants to feed the world's 1.8 billion Muslims. Building the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, along that there is plenty of countries along that all the way to Europe. On both sides of that, uh, whether it's the maritime or the land Belt and Road, Plenty of consumers there, plenty of markets there that they can do with Chinese products. China alone, they have about 500 kosher certified factories. Now, if you think halal certification and halal requirements are strict, kosher is even more stricter. Yet China, because it's commercial, nothing to do with anything else, the fact that this is a commercial proposition and there is some business that could be generated out of these activities, China is leading now looking into this. We've had several discussions bank to bank on trying to um, see how we could support businesses across um, the border. Uh, increasing affluence, the, the, the uh, middle class is growing in, in majority Muslim countries, uh, increasing religious affinity, people feel more affiliated towards doing ethical consumer consumerism, and religion is becoming more important to people, they feel affiliated to uh, adhering to certain values. Digital connectivity made it also easier to, to source for products, to buy products, to um, uh, find out more about products. So the, the digital connectivity has made it also more pressing for companies and SMEs to respond to this demand. Ethical consumerism, I mentioned that when I mentioned about the, the increasing religious affinity. Multinational growth businesses, 58% of CEOs surveyed are rethinking their business models and looking for new growth avenues. I mentioned uh, Nestle, and I remember um, I used to have a friend who was in the F&B sector in the UK, and at one point in time, he said McDonald's, where their chicken burgers were all halal, because they were buying from one um, uh, supplier in Belgium, and they would not distinguish, they did not see a need to go and advertise it as such, but that's the size of the market and how um, it's more cost-saving for them to have one kitchen than to have two kitchens producing halal and non-halal. Economic diversification and development, only two of the 57 OIC countries are in the top 25 global economies uh, with 224 million people malnourished in OIC countries. So you can see that there is still you know, room for improvement, for doing a lot more um, development activities. Halal trade is still very small. And um, I, when I mentioned later about the ranking of countries and you'll see why halal trade is, is very important. Regulation, uh, Malaysia is leading on, in this, uh, uh, the certification and the standards um, in, in Malaysia are considered the gold standard for halal certification globally. Although this has been, there's a, uh, other countries are catching up, particularly in Dubai, they are now going, they're doing the accreditation across the entire globe. They are no longer looking at just one country, but they're looking how to unify this to be uh, more accessible to different countries and to have a unified way of uh, accrediting halal certified products. Investor returns, 200, uh, 2 trillion US dollars in private equity, dry powder seeking high growth investment opportunities. These are the investment opportunities for in the halal sector in, in 1.2 trillion, the growth is, is, is 400%. And these are the, the drivers for that, you know, the halal products, the key sectors, Islamic finance, Islamic lifestyle, and the halal products, food and cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, etc. And the key investor categories, private equity is 13%, venture capitalist 6%, angel investor 1%, corporates are still 80%. Now, if you look at the ranking of top Islamic economy indicator score, Malaysia is still number one. UAE is number two and catching fast. 
Now, what makes Malaysia number one? Um, what makes UAE actually the second one? UAE is four million, the population. Uh, Malaysia is 30 million. I mean, you would expect that the biggest one will be, you know, Indonesia. Where is Indonesia? You know, the largest Muslim population. And then after that will be India, you know, by ranking of, of, of population, of Muslim population. In Indonesia, then India, then Pakistan, Bangladesh. But it's not. UAE is only four million people. Expats make the majority of them. And it's not really a large um, Muslim consumer economy yet they are ranking number two. What goes into that mix that makes them number two? Many things. Uh, declared government policies, uh, uh, banking sector, uh, regulation around it, R&D, uh, and the main thing that made the United Arab Emirates the number two there is trade. Being a trade hub, they can import and re-export through that hub and then get the benefit of being a center for trade financing and, straight and, and the center for halal trade across the globe. Uh, not Saudi Arabia, even though they have you know, the, the large uh, visitors you know, during Hajj and Umrah and they, they you know massive economy in terms of um, uh, revenue and, and oil revenue, et cetera. Uh, not Indonesia, not, but United Arab Emirates. So they're catching up, they want to share our lunch, they want to come and compete with us and take this away from Malaysia. At some point in time, they're investing heavily in R&D, they're investing heavily in uh, becoming the, as they claim, the capital of halal economy globally. Uh, and this is why I think you know, it's important for us um, to, to see this as, a, as something very relevant to the development of the Malaysian economy going forward. The government has seen this, the government, that's why the government is is putting this as, a, as part of the budget, as a national agenda item, because it gave Malaysia leadership in this sector here, of a sector that is likely to grow. Now, if you think about it, why would China want to feed the world's 1.8 billion Muslims? Leave politics aside, it's nothing to do with, with religion, it's nothing to do with what, how people decide to, to pray, it's to do with the business incentives. That's all there is to it. So, um, and these are the ranking here, as you can see, the United Arab Emirates already uh, top in terms of halal food, you know, four million people made it to the top, as opposed to second is Brazil, Australia, because of their export. Brazil is the largest, if you see the heat map, I'll show it in a minute. Brazil is the largest exporter of, of halal meat globally. And then you can see the other companies, uh, countries of the sizable population, not Brunei, definitely. Uh, Muslim friendly travel, Malaysia is still number one. So this is an area where tourism, as, as the earlier speaker mentioned, tourism is a very important area. Education, uh, overseas education, uh, medical tourism, just tourism full stop. This is an area we, we should be focusing on to maintain that ranking and not let other countries catching up uh, fast enough. Modest fashion, UAE is ranking number one, Turkey is second, Indonesia third, Malaysia is fourth. Media and recreation, Malaysia is second. Pharmaceutical, Malaysia is second. I'm, I'm very surprised at the, at the pharmaceutical because I would have thought Malaysia would be number one. Now, if you look at it um, in more details and see that Brazil is the largest exporter of halal certified uh, products, meat, followed by Australia and then Sudan. Sudan is a large country with, with massive livestock um, Turkey, um, India, China still hasn't come into this. Total size is 1.37 trillion, likely to grow to 1.2 2, 2 trillion by 2024. I think it will be higher than this if the methodology starts to be refined as we go along. So don't be surprised if you see that this number is, is massively um, underestimated. Um, the main sectors there are the halal ingredients, food ingredients, uh, halal uh, food themselves, uh, food technology, retail concepts, meat-based uh, products. Another country actually that's not mentioned in, in, in this uh, mix here and is considered the largest, one of the largest exporters of um, processed meat, halal processed meat, is Thailand. 
Uh, but you will see it in the other slide when I show the ranking by trading nations. Islamic finance, uh, Malaysia is third. Uh, if you consider countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran because of the larger, Iran is, you know, they, they, their entire system is, is, um, is, is based on um, Islamic banking concepts. So they, the entire country's uh, banking system is, is uh, Islamic. So by virtue of that, but for Malaysia uh, to have uh, to be on third, knowing that the Islamic banking share of the market is about 30% at the moment, and the government's in, um, target of 40% is next year. Um, we are still in a very good place to, to continue to grow in that sector here. Modest fashion, um, India is the largest, as I, as I said, you know, India is the largest exporter, is textile. China is the largest, India is the second. So China is coming into play already here in the halal, global halal economy by virtue of exporting of textile. Turkey is third and Italy is fourth. Media and recreation, China is number one. This is, you know, uh, what, when you consider what's involved here, you know, including toys, then I think you'll say, ah, okay, I know, now I know why it's number one. So um, halal cosmetics, France is the number one. Uh, you know, we saw that coming. Second one is the UAE. I mean, not the manufacturers by any chance, but redistributors is an export hub is the trading of these um, products out of the UAE. Germany and China. As you can see, you know, that this is, you, you did not see anywhere Egypt or um, as a leading country in this, or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan. Or, these are businesses here doing, spotting a need in the market and they're responding to it. Halal pharmaceuticals, again, France, uh, Germany, uh, third one, United States and India. Now, where does Malaysia stand in terms of halal products exported out of Malaysia to the rest of the world? We are number 15. We are still ahead of UAE. I don't know, this is a mistake, by the way, from the publishers because Brazil is mentioned twice. Italy, but we are, uh, Indonesia doing better by virtue of size. Argentina, Germany, Russia, France, China, India, US, and Brazil is number one. Um, now this is the area here, if we were to look at where we could be doing better, is the export. Now how do we enable <coughs> ourselves to be export ready for, for us to support the Malaysian economy and for us to spot the growth area? Now why should this global economy be spotted by companies in Germany, in France, in Italy, and, and not by companies here in Malaysia? What does it take for us to respond to this? And I'll come to this in my last slide, and I'll do a little bit of um, advertising as I. Um, the Malaysian halal economy opportunity, I mean, we spoke about FinTech and the, and, the, uh, and the digital economy, which is also another area that is very relevant when we speak about the growth of Islamic economy and, and the halal sectors. Now, what have we done? Uh, as a bank in order to respond to this in, in CIMB. When we spotted this area, we realized we had several discussions um, with the right authorities, with several partners in this sector, and we wanted to understand why does it, what does it take for Malaysian businesses to be able to maintain that leadership globally in this sector. <coughs> um, the number one challenge that came was the issue of certification. Now, you will be surprised to know that out of the total population of 900, almost 907,000 SMEs here in Malaysia at the end of 2000 and, um, at the end of 2018, how many do you think is the number of certified halal companies that ready, not all of them are exporters, but how many do you think in percentage? 20%, who thinks it's 20% or less? Less. 10% or less? Less, five percent or less. One percent or less. Uh, now I'm 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 pushing it too far, too far. Huh? It's actually less than one percent. Eight thousand companies out of the total. Now not all of the nine hundred and seven thousand are need to be certified. If they are in electronics or they are in real estate, what will they do with certification of buildings or ingredients? 
But that just shows that you know, there is still plenty of room to do. Now, what are the obstacles that's stopping these country, uh, companies from acquiring those halal certifications? And two things. Number one is the perception or the reality of the cost element associated with it. And we've discussed this with the relevant authority, and we realized that you know, there is, uh, to get halal certification, the actual fee to get the certification is less than 1,000 ringgit. But then the requirements to be to qualify for that could be more. You may have to build a new storage. You may have to buy a new truck. You may have to employ a certain person with certain skills. Uh, you may have to do a few things. And then the access to funding is prohibitive. It stops companies from approaching, um, considering this. Uh, the second aspect is access to market. Now, where do we go if we want to export? If we want to you know, reach other countries, we spoke now about potential in Middle East, potential in Africa, Europe. Um, people want to have access to this, uh, these products certified because of market demand. And because you know, it's, it's no longer about uh, faith, it's more about business. Access to market is the second challenge that we found that to be um, um, one of the reasons, you know, obstacles, if I may say. So what did the, the way we responded, these are the numbers here, Malaysian exports in those five sectors. Um, uh, that, that we will focus on. So 8.6, uh, 8.8 billion ringgit. Uh, do you remember what was the total number that we mentioned about um, food earlier? 1.3 trillion US dollars. So our export in terms of, of uh, food and beverages from Malaysia is very small. Pharmaceuticals, cosmetics, agribusiness, and Malaysian halal exports totaling, um, in, in terms of fashion, 5.7 billion, very small. This is textile and, and garments and clothing. There's nothing halal there about them, but it's just the way it's labeled. So in, in CIMB, what we're trying to do now is we, we're working with partners, um, as they listed there, to facilitate this, to work with them in order to come up with propositions that we will be um, launching hopefully soon, uh, aiming at the availing access to enable SMEs to be able to take up this journey of halal certification. And also we are working with other partners like the Trade Club Alliance uh, powered by Santander Bank to provide access to our exporters, uh, SME ready, uh, export ready SMEs here in Malaysia who want to expo explore other markets. We have had some success stories already. We've had, if you were there last year, uh, this year actually, during MIHAS, the, the, the Malaysian uh, international halal uh, uh, showcase. Um, there was, we have the business matching area. There was some of our clients came and we have, uh, we were able to match, match them with some Korean companies who are interested in looking into this and formulating some. There were one of them was in cosmetics and the other one was in the halal ingredients. So they were looking to formulate a particular sauce uh, for a restaurant here in, in, in Malaysia. And they were happy to look at the halal aspects of it. Now, there is more to be done, and I think this is one of the areas SMEs in general here in Malaysia and the Malaysian economy will be very supportive. There's market demand, and there is um, uh, plenty of work that we can do together, and we look forward to developing this sector together as it's, I think, it's a national challenge for us to stay number one. Thank you very much. It, questions? Do you have questions now? Or? It's okay not to have questions. If you don't have questions, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Mr. Hussam. All right. Four questions, all right. Um, questions via Slido. You can key in your event code, hashtag SME Forum 2. <laughs> via Slido. <coughs> yep. None. He, he wants to ask directly. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Mr. Sultan, um, I do have a question regarding the uh, halal industry. Uh, I wasn't um, able to attend the World Halal Conference uh, recently, but I was wondering what is the um, general, general direction uh, the halal industry is heading in because uh, there are personal concerns on the the reputation or, or the marketing aspects of uh, halal industry, uh, where that uh, for Muslims and non-Muslims, um, 
why are things like uh, clothing or uh, maybe electronics, um, maybe tourism, in fact, certain parts of tourism, has to be uh, part of a halal, um, a halal economy, you know? So my question is, um, what are the uh, ways to deal with the um, reputation and the controversy? I mean, business dictates. When there's business opportunity, businessmen will step in and they will do the marketing and they will, if there is an opportunity and people feel sentimental about buying certain products that carry certain, they will go for it. I don't think it's wrong. You know, we've seen uh, spiritual tourism in, in uh, you know, you can even say the Hajj and Umrah, spiritual tourism, people go there to feel good, to feel better. Uh, you know, China, there is plenty of spiritual sites that they have spiritual tourism there. So if people want to feel that way, why not? If people are after these products, there has to be someone providing this. If there is a business opportunity, then it's good for the economy and, and it's a win-win situation. Uh, reputational risk, I'm not sure whether if it's reputational risk as in the fact that it is halal and the fact that it is Islamic and the fact that it is religious. Uh, you know, we we'll just have to, uh, we've had this many times before. Um, as I said before, it's just um, some people probably need to look beyond the, the fact that it's um, um, religious affiliation. Um, I, I really don't think um, there's any reputational risk there. Um, uh, you know, there's plenty, you know, if you go to the UK, for example, now, and you see all those donut kebab shops, and uh, people, you know, the biggest customers of those are, you know, Friday night and Saturday night, uh, uh, you know, after the nightclub, people will go there, and they say, no, I'm not going there, it's halal, you know, let's go to the non-halal, because we've just had some few pints more than we should. I don't think there is reputational risk will be even if you stay silent, mm. just by the fact that you would be practicing something, they, there's a reputational risk. Uh, Taib, we um, will just have to grow out of this and, and just treat business as business and, and, and just. Uh, but uh, my, my, my main concern is not the reputational risk of um, businesses per se, but what was the reputation of uh, Islam in general because it might lead to um, misunderstandings between uh, non-Muslims and even Muslims on, on the fact of what constitutes to halal. If, if you want conflict to reduce, just increase the level of business, let people trade more, let them engage in, in building factories and employing people and selling products, and you'll have less conflict. People but conflict more when they are unemployed and there's poverty and there's, if this is gonna solve some of these problems, then let it be. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Right, our first question, right side, would be: What does CRMB offering in order to help boost halal industry in many key areas of the market? Well, last year was it last year? Yes, September last year we launched the China, China ASEAN uh, Halal Corridor. We formulated a strategy called the Halal Corridor, and our idea there was to enable businesses in Malaysia who want to be linked with businesses in other parts of the world to talk to us and we will make that linkages, that linkage. It is happening now, and we have a few of our customers that we have linked them with buyers or sellers, actually, in, in different countries. As I said, you know, one of the obstacles that we have come to realize is the access to funding to acquire certification, particularly for SMEs. And we are working on this, and very soon, uh, we will be uh, able to launch something in the market <coughs> to, to facilitate this. All right. Our third question would be: We have Sharia compliant companies in Malaysia. Is it same as halal? Yes. Oh. How similar? Oh. Is it same as halal? Sorry, we have Sharia compliant companies in Malaysia. Is it same as halal certified companies? Uh, again, to me, halal certified companies means you have JAKIM certification. Whether you are Sharia compliant or whether you are the most the purest of companies selling the purest of products. If you're not JAKM certified, then you're not HALA certified. Simple. All right. How similar or different are the certification processes in Malaysia and UAE? I think there is mutual recognition of each other's certification. So if you have a JAKM certified product, you can sell in, in the UAE and vice versa. But there are other countries where they, you know, our um, neighbor in, in Indonesia, they have specific requirements that the products has to be labeled as per the uh, official Indonesian label of, of halal certification. Um, 
there will be some differences in the details, you know, certain products, certain ingredients, but by in large, uh, there are accepted uh, standards globally. There's about, you know, uh, halal, ver verify halal is here. That, um, um, Madame Juan Amna was here. She left, I think. But they, they, they know better. They have 72 countries, I think, have signed up to JAKIM, and they are uh, in recognition of each other's certification um, standards. Right, next question would be, is CIMB Islamic entering into a digital space or getting into a partnership in halal? I mean, if, if you want to talk to us, let's talk, yes. If I, I can't answer this, I say yes, because you know, we are, everyone is paying attention to digital. There's, I don't think there's any business can afford not to look at digital and, and digital transformation and digital solutions and digital enablement. So the answer is yes, are we looking to, to, we are partnering with Verify Halal, they are a digital platform. They, you know, they do halal verification using SKU codes and QR codes, etc. So we are in partnership with them, but no one can afford to not pay attention to uh, digital solutions. All right, our last question from Mr. Husan would be how, sorry, from Ju Chen Fry as well. Okay, how can non-Muslims contribute the halal business Export in Malaysia. As simple as drinking this water. Just, just if you are in business, then then continue to do business. If you spot a market opportunity in another country where you think there is advantage of being halal certified, uh, in the, in the first country that has the, that advantage will be your own home country, Malaysia. Then get certifi certification, and uh, it has nothing to do. As I mentioned, it's it's more to do with business and opportunities and expansion and growth and global reach than is to do with how you practice and what. Uh, practices of religion. Mr. Hussam, that's all from us. All right, thank you very much. You. All right, please give a round of applause to the Nchi Hussam from CIMB Islamic Bank, Burkhardt.